A twilight tour of Newstead Abbey. Excited tourists line up to check in. You quietly contemplate the medieval mansion. It's massive. A foreboding stone building that manages to be elegant, despite its hodgepodge architecture of Gothic, Baroque, and Renaissance styles. Swirling fog hangs low, shrouding the first floor. The tour guide begins to recount to the history of the Abbey. As you step inside, a chill rolls down your spine. Someone is watching. You look back over the gardens, but there is nothing except fog. Elegant rooms, thick, colorful patterned rugs, rich wooden paneling, paintings of nobility, arches and gleaming gold sconces, beautiful echoes of times past. But with each room, your unease grows. Your body begins to feel off, light and heavy at the same time. Sorrow hangs in the air here, and you're weighed down by a sense of doom. Your heart beats faster and faster. You leave the tour and stumble outside for some fresh air. You wander through the maze of the Spanish garden, trying to make sense of the strange feeling coursing through your body. At the end of the row, blocking the maze, stands a monk in a black cassock and cloak. His face is hidden by a heavy hood. He holds up a hand and crooks a pale forefinger in your direction. You're transfixed. Your body is so heavy and languished, it feels like each movement takes an incredible effort. You think in your mind that you're stuck here, glued forever to this place. But your feet are moving. Slowly, compulsively, you walk toward the monk in black. Welcome to Haunted Places. I'm Greg Polson. Every Thursday, I take you to the scariest, eeriest, most haunted, real places on Earth. This week, join me on a supernatural journey to the mysterious Newstead Abbey in Nottinghamshire, UK, and discover why, to this day, it's haunted. Listen to more episodes of Haunted Places, as well as ParCast's other podcasts, on your favorite podcast directory. We're also on Facebook and Instagram, at ParCast, on Twitter, at ParCast Network, and at ParCast.com. Many of you have asked how you can support Haunted Places. If you enjoy the show, the best way to support us is to leave a five-star review, wherever you're listening. At the end of a mile-long drive through the verdant parkland sprawls the grand, haunting, and melancholy Newstead Abbey. Situated in the eastern midlands of the UK, Newstead Abbey has graced the Nottinghamshire County skyline for over 800 years. Originally, the abbey was built as an Augustinian priory sometime around 1165. The monks that resided there were known as Black Cannons, on account of their black cassocks, which were worn with white surplices and hooded black cloaks. For nearly 400 years, the monks of Newstead served God and supported their local community, studying medicine and offering comfort to the poor. Newstead Abbey was well known for providing respite to passing crusaders and pilgrims. But then, King Henry VIII had a problem. Though already married, he wanted to marry Anne Boleyn. The Pope refused to grant Henry a divorce. In 1533, Henry split from the Catholic Church, declared himself the head of the Church of England, and married Anne. Spiritual leaders protested, and in retaliation, King Henry set about dissolving religious communities. There wasn't much time. Brother John quickly wrapped the vellum in cloth and put it into his pack. God willing, he'd finish the manuscript someday. Brother Thomas called for help from the church. 
When John and a few other monks rushed in, Thomas pointed at the heavy brass lectern shaped like an eagle. They would not allow the soldiers to steal it. It took the combined strength of brothers John, Eustace, and Thomas to free the lectern from its moorings. They carried it outside, across the garden, and heaved it into the lake. The monks were tossing bundles of food from the storehouse to a crowd of beggars when they heard horses thundering up the road. Shouting soldiers on horseback crashed into the crowd with their brandished swords held aloft as a glimmering threat to anyone who dared challenge them. The beggars scattered in terror. A toddler got separated from his mother and stood right in the path of a charging soldier. As the child was trampled, his muted cries were drowned in a cacophony of screams. The monks ran inside the abbey. John glanced back, spotting Thomas, crouched in the dust over the bleeding child. John shouted for him to come, but his friend did not respond. John's last glimpse of Thomas was him cradling the dead child to his chest, boldly facing the soldiers. John turned away as the edge of a sword flashed in the afternoon sunlight. The monks ran through the abbey until they reached a trap door and, one by one, quickly dropped down into the darkness. The rich scent of earth filled John's nostrils as he landed awkwardly in the tunnel, twisting his ankle. The last monk yanked a rug over the secret door as best he could, trying to hide their escape route. Crouching low to fit the tight passageway, the monks crept forward in the darkness. Overhead, they could hear the soldiers plundering the house of God. John wondered how long they'd been in the tunnel. Surely they'd left the abbey hours ago. His back ached from his hunched over walking position. He could just make out the shape of the monk in front of him. Their shapes were dark bent over in defeat. Their feet shuffled in such a way that they looked as though they were floating. Sweat or tears stung John's eyes. He wasn't sure which. He kept replaying the last moment of Thomas's life in his mind, the righteous rage in Thomas's eyes, the crimson staining of the limp child's tunic, the sharp glitter of the sword. Why would God take Thomas? He was the best of them, never faltering in his faith. The dirt under their feet had turned to mud. With every step, it squelched through John's toes. He shuddered. The tunnel stretched before them, black and endless. One of the other monks softly prayed. John's mouth was dry. His tongue felt thick and swollen, but it didn't matter. He wondered if God was even listening to their prayers. In the darkness, there was only the blood of the child, the screams of the beggars, the last image of his defiant friend. He could not escape them here. He could not think of anything else. The sights, the sounds of the massacre, they would consume him in this terrible place. Just when John thought he'd go mad, they came to the end of the tunnel. A few monks squeezed together to hoist Eustace up so he could reach the trap door. Eustace was able to open it and swing himself up into the barn. The other monks quickly helped each other out of the tunnel. They lay on the dusty floor of the barn, savoring the fresh air. God be praised they were safe. They could wait until night and then slip away under the cover of dark. The monks strained their ears, listening. They could come out now. The monks crept to the door and pushed it, but it wouldn't budge. They pushed harder, and the door opened a few inches, enough to see the line of soldiers waiting outside faces filled with patience and determination. The monks let the door shut. What should they do? They couldn't go back to the abbey. 
they would have to wait the soldiers out. Suddenly, the barn door was wrenched open and smoldering tar-soaked rags were thrown in. Hay burst into flames, sending up thick black smoke. John tried to force open the door. It had been barricaded shut. Eustace and the others tried to stamp out burning hay, but only got singed feet for their pains. A mound of smoldering hay fell, blocking the trap door to the tunnel. Within seconds, the whole barn was ablaze. John's skin tightened. His chest hurt. It was getting hard to breathe. Understanding that death was near, he knelt and began to pray. Slowly, the other monks quit begging at the door and joined him. As their skin blistered and their lungs seared from hot smoke, the monks of Newstead Abbey knelt in a circle and prayed. Their final thoughts focused on God as they met a fiery end. Legend has it that seven monks escaped the soldiers pillaging Newstead Abbey. They crept through an underground tunnel that led to a barn a few miles away in Mansfield Village. Sadly, the monks were betrayed. The barn was set alight, and the monks burned to death. In the late 1700s, Newstead's lake was dredged, and the Brass Eagle Lectern was discovered. The lectern currently graces the Southwell Minster Cathedral near the Abbey. There are whispers of treasures hidden by the Black Cannons. A well-known ghostly presence at the Abbey is a gloomy, silent monk. This Black Friar roams the woods and gardens of Newstead, his face hidden deep within the hood of the black cloak he wears over his cassock. He appears and vanishes at will. Could it be brave Brother Thomas watching over his former home? Or maybe a remorseful Brother John doomed to roam the earth, anguished over his lack of faith? Many have found the spectral monk's presence foreboding, though there are no accounts of him harming the living. Yet. We'll have more on the monks of Newstead Abbey after the break. It's not a ParCast podcast, but if you like haunted places, I think you might like The Horror of Dolores Roach, a new horror fiction podcast I found. The Horror of Dolores Roach tells a macabre urban legend of murder, betrayal, weed, gentrification, cannibalism, and survival of the fittest. When Dolores Roach returns to her old New York City neighborhood after 16 years in prison, she's stunned by all that's changed. The only person remaining from her previous life is Luis, an old stoner friend who gives her room and board in the basement underneath his dilapidated empanada shop. When the promise of her newfound stability is quickly threatened, Magic Hands Dolores is driven to extremes to survive. The Horror of Dolores Roach stars Daphne Rubin Vega and Bobby Cannavale and is written by Aaron Mark. I think it's a great podcast, but don't take my word for it. Refinery29 says, The Horror of Dolores Roach stands out from the rest. It's totally fictional, but still equally chilling. You can listen to all episodes of The Horror of Dolores Roach now for free, wherever you get your podcasts. As the giant grew closer, Enceladus realized something was wrong. Instead of legs, Enceladus and his brother giants slithered on two large serpents with snapping maws where the feet should be. But this giant's serpents weren't snapping, and its face sagged. An arrow whizzed past Enceladus' face. This wasn't a giant. It was a god. You foolish, foolish giant. No one rebels against the gods and escapes unscathed. Athena, the goddess of war and wisdom, peeled off the face of a giant she'd flayed alive, revealing her own face, dripping with blood. 
Parcast's new mythology podcast dramatizes ancient myths for a modern audience and dives into their history, origins, and meaning. Hosted by my friend Vanessa Richardson, Mythology uses an ensemble cast to bring these stories to life. Every episode dramatizes an exciting story pulled from the beliefs of ancient cultures and gives insight into how our ancestors saw the universe. Stick around after this episode to hear a preview of Mythology's Part 1 on the Greek goddess Athena. New episodes come out every Tuesday. Search for and subscribe to Mythology wherever you listen to podcasts. And now, back to the story. Not long after Newstead Abbey was dissolved, King Henry sold the property to Sir John Byron on the condition that he remove all evidence of the religious community. Sir Byron obliged, demolished the church portion of the abbey, but retained a stabilizing wall, thus creating the stunning arch to nowhere on the western right wing of the house that still stands to this day. The stone harvested from the destroyed church was used to build other rooms onto the abbey. Over time, the Byron family added to the building, eventually creating a multi-storied mansion constructed around a central courtyard. The upkeep and additions to the abbey waxed and waned according to the Byron family fortunes. In 1733, William Byron, fifth Baron Byron of Rochdale, inherited the property. He was known as the Wicked Lord for his violent temper and extravagant spending. William fought a duel with his cousin over a petty argument and stabbed him in the stomach, murdering him. Because of his noble lineage, William managed to beat the court case and only had to pay a small fine. However, the incident caused a scandal, and to escape the public eye, William retired to the countryside and took up residence at Newstead Abbey. At the Abbey, William felt isolated, cut off from society. He terrorized his servants and abused his wife, who eventually left him. As the years passed, William Byron grew increasingly eccentric and paranoid. He rarely left the Abbey, and when he did, he traveled under an assumed name. William staged elaborate mock naval battles on the lake and held orgies in the folly. His existence became more and more surreal. He trusted no one. His delusions ran rampant. Eventually, he came to fear for his very life. William had arranged for some timber to be cut down. He stood by in satisfaction, watching the trees fall. He needed the money from the lumber, sure, but it was more than that. William didn't want his miserable cur of a son inheriting the valuable wood. The lumbering upset a flock of rooks. They took to the sky, angrily cawing. Nasty things. Annoyed by their shrill cries, William ordered the gamekeeper to shoot them. The gamekeeper refused mumbling about how rooks were the soul of the abbey and it was bad luck to harm them. William dismissed him on the spot and went hunting for the beasts himself. He shot several birds, enough to momentarily silence their incessant cause. Rooks weren't particularly good eating, but he had his cook prepare them anyway. At dinner, he happily dug into the rook pie Eating one's enemy was such delicious revenge. The birds he did not shoot, however, were onto him. William was having a picnic by the lake when a single rook flew over. It opened its beak and dropped something. William shrieked when the eyeball fell into his lap. He shuddered in disgust and flung it away. William looked up. Hundreds of rooks were perched in a nearby tree. The chill went down his spine. The message was loud and clear. We're watching you. From that moment on, William was under attack. Rooks pecked at his head whenever he was outside, covered his skiff in their nasty droppings, and even 
fluttered their wings against the windows late at night to disturb his sleep. They stared at him with their beady black eyes, looking into the depths of his heart, and found him wanting. Even now they watched him. He knew it. William peered out the window, but didn't see anything. He put a spyglass to his eye. Ah, there. Perched on the statue in the fountain were several large black rooks, feathered demons. Oh, damnable birds holding him prisoner in his own home. Sweating, William stumbled back from the window in his study and paced. He didn't believe in superstition. He had been a Royal Naval officer, for God's sake. And yet, the rooks seemed so clever. Too clever to be mere birds. William gulped his whiskey. He'd send a servant to Mansfield to buy some poison. That would be much faster than another bird hunt. William was angry. None of his staff would obey his orders. They were treasonous, siding with the feathered devils. He would go to the village himself. The elderly groom pleaded with William. He had worked the estate all his life. The rooks were special. William should leave them alone. Bad things came to those who harmed the rooks. William ignored the warning and forced the groom to hand over his cap. William pulled the cap low on his head and wrapped himself in a cloak. He almost made it off the property. Before the birds discovered his disguise, they dive-bombed him, nipping at the haunches of his horse. The stallion reared back, rolling its eyes. William pulled on the reins, fighting for control. Whoa, whoa! He fell out of the saddle, and then the world went dark as the horse came down on him. William stirred. Every inch of his body ached. Dr. Smythe helped him sit up in bed. He rang the bell and asked the maid to bring William a tisane. William had been unconscious for two days. The doctor predicted that he would make a full recovery. He should quit riding while drunk, though. Over the doctor's shoulder, William could see a rook peering through the window, its black eyes glittering, glorying in its victory. William spluttered, interrupting the doctor mid-lecture. It's the birds, the birds, feathered demons trying to murder me. The maid dropped the tea. She apologized and bobbed a curtsy, but she was looking at the doctor and not William. Actually, both she and the doctor wouldn't look William in the eye. They exchanged pitying glances. They thought the old lord was going mad. Except William knew he wasn't. Those winged nightmares, spawns of hell, sought to end his life. Local Nottingham folklore claimed that the rooks of Newstead Abbey were more than mere birds. The souls of the black cannons resided in the rooks. They watched over and protected the abbey. Allegedly, the rooks were extremely intelligent and observed the Sabbath. For six days out of the week, the rooks would fly around the countryside, hunting for food, only returning to roost at twilight. However, on Sundays, the rooks stayed on the grounds of the abbey, visiting each other, seemingly marking God's day of rest. The reincarnation of the black cannons as rooks was so widely believed that local Nottingham authorities decreed that the rooks of Newstead were to be left alone instead of culled, as was customarily practiced. This decree surely haunted Lord William, whose misfortunes did not stop with the possessed birds. Having squandered his wife's dowry, William planned for his son to marry advantageously and bring money into the family coffers. Alas, his son fell in love and eloped with his poor, unsuitable cousin. Enraged, William sought to beggar the Newstead property, 
ensuring that his son would inherit a penniless estate. He had the ancient timber that surrounded the lake, cut down and sold. He also had scores of valuable hunting game wastefully slaughtered. Ultimately, the wicked lord failed in his revenge. William survived into his 70s, outliving his son and grandson, who both died tragically young. When he passed away, William's branch of the Byron family died out. The family title and Newstead Abbey were bestowed on the eldest male Byron heir, William's grand nephew. Through thy battlements, Newstead, the hollow winds whistle. Though the hall of my fathers art gone to decay, in thy once smiling garden the hemlock and thistle have choked up the rose which late bloomed in the way. George Gordon Byron, sixth Baron Byron, inherited the neglected Newstead Abbey in 1798 at the tender age of 10. After his university days, Lord Byron periodically lived at Newstead between the ages of 20 and 26. A famed poet and war hero, Byron was also notorious for his many scandalous affairs. Byron found retreating to the countryside to stay at the Abbey restful. Unfortunately, the Abbey was in a terrible state. Byron refurbished and maintained a handful of rooms for comfort's sake. But a significant portion of the mansion was uninhabitable, and he was without the funds to fix it. Byron would frequently have house parties, and members of his entourage would spend weeks at a time visiting him at Newstead. The dashing young nobles explored the estate, finding mystic relics of times past. It started out as a lark, really. Some old friends from Cambridge had come up for a week to hunt, play cards, and see what his ancestral pile looked like. After a fantastic lunch, Byron's pockets may be let, but it could never be said that he didn't provide an excellent table. The men had gone outside. They were playing fetch with his puppy when Lord Wright looked up at the facade of the church and wondered aloud if the monks had buried any treasure at the abbey. This sparked a mad search that only uncovered the coffins of some long dead monks. Egged on by his friends, Byron reached into the casket and pulled out the monk's skull. He held it up and made it talk. Everyone laughed except for boring old Carlyle, who found the whole business blasphemous. Byron ordered a groom to clean the skeleton and assemble the bones in the dining room. It was declared that there was another guest for dinner, though he wouldn't be eating much. Throughout the meal, they nearly split their sides, making ribald jokes at the skeleton's expense. When they had their after-dinner brandies while playing pool, Byron insisted on drinking out of the monk's skull. It sent a little shiver down his spine to do so. An angry voice hissed something unintelligible from the corners of his room. Lord Byron snuggled deeper into bed and sighed, not even bothering to open his eyes. Ah, really, Fordham, do you think I'd fall for such a stupid prank? The men had retired to their beds around midnight, a little tipsy. They're not meant for you. The voice was louder this time. Annoyed, Byron sat up and drew back the bed curtains, planning to give the intruder a piece of his mind. The angry retort died on his lips. Standing next to the bed was a monk, donning a long black robe. His eyes were black. His skin glowed ghostly white. Byron frantically felt for his pistol. The monk raised a pale hand. Freezing wind swept through the bedroom. They are not yours to keep. The ghost curled his hand into a fist, and Byron's throat closed up, making it hard to breathe. 
His tongue froze in his mouth, but he was able to nod convulsively. The monk opened his fist, and Byron fell back onto the bed, shuddering, sucking in fresh air. When he looked up, the monk was gone. The next morning, Byron awoke with a splitting headache, pondering the events of the night before. He was sure he had experienced a nightmare after imbibing too much wine. It was doubtful he had been visited by a specter. But all the same, he ordered his servants to rebury the skeleton of the monk. Allegedly, while hunting for treasure, Lord Byron dug up the graves of some long dead monks. For a while, he displayed their skulls in his study. While at Newstead, Byron always slept with a pistol next to his bed. It may have been for protection against angry husbands seeking vengeance for Byron's sordid seduction of their wives. But it may also have been for protection against something supernatural. Famously and most morbidly, Byron had a drinking cup made from the skull cap of a monk and even wrote a poem on the subject. Though Byron's original skull cap drinking vessel has been lost to history, a replica currently resides at Newstead. I lived, I loved, I coughed like thee, I died. Let earth my bones resign, fill up, thou canst not injure me. The worm hath fouler lips than thine. More from Newstead Abbey after the break. Now, back to the story. Deep in debt, in 1818, Lord Byron sold Newstead Abbey to his childhood friend, Colonel Thomas Wildman. Colonel Wildman set about rebuilding the abbey. Over the next 40 years, he spent a fortune restoring the abbey to its former glory and adding touches of his own, such as custom wood paneling, gothic decorations, and the East Tower. As the beautiful gardens were planted, the Abbey began to draw many admiring guests. Sophie set the coins on the counter. Ducking her head, she slipped out of the shop. It was hard enough to come to the village knowing the stares she'd receive, but it truly hurt that the proprietor wouldn't even take the money from her hand. She was deaf, not cursed or stupid. Sophie took the long way home, walking through the parkland of Newstead. She loved the mansion. It was old, beautiful, and had a melancholy air, exactly the sort of home a poet should own. Of course, Lord Byron didn't own Newstead anymore, but she liked to pretend that he did. Sometimes she even dared to imagine she and Byron strolling the gardens hand in hand. They would stop, he would turn her face up to his, and say, Sophie was never quite sure what Byron would say, but it was something very romantic before he passionately kissed her. Sophie was startled out of her fantasy when she came face to face with Colonel Wildman and a gardener. They were clearly surprised to see her. The Colonel said something. Sophie shook her head, miming that she couldn't hear. Sophie backed away. She was trespassing on private property. He could have her arrested. Colonel Wildman reached for her arm. She darted off the path and into the underbrush, thorns from bushes tearing her dress, her only thought to get away. The vicar came to tea at the farm. Sophie sat in her usual spot in the corner, carefully observing the conversation between her aunt and the vicar. She could lip-read some. After they had eaten, the vicar kindly wrote on her slate, explaining that the Wildmans had asked him about her. She had their approval to roam the grounds of Newstead at will. Sophie spent many a happy afternoon at the Abbey. Through gestures and notes, she had come to know the Wildmans. They were a lovely couple with an eye for beauty. The gardens looked especially beautiful on this perfect spring day. 
Sophie tried her best to hold back her tears. She had cried when Aunt Lavinia succumbed to the flu. She had cried when the solicitor did the sums, and she realized that she would have to leave the farm and throw herself on the mercy of her relatives in America. But on her last walk through the grounds of her beloved Newstead Abbey, on the way to Nottingham to catch the mail coach to London, she would savor the beauty and she would not cry. Sophie gave the gardener a letter, indicating that it was for the Wildmans. They had been so kind, and she would never see them or the Abbey again. She continued on toward the village, ignoring her stinging eyes. Tom couched low in the saddle as the horse galloped up the road. He had to find Sophie. Just ahead, the village of Nottingham was coming into view. The streets were crowded, citizens shopping, enjoying the fine spring weather. Then he saw her, a thin, pale girl with dark circles under her eyes. Sophie wore a gray morning dress and carried a single valise. Tom waved his arm, attempting to catch her attention, but Sophie didn't see him. She began crossing the street toward the inn. A driver shouted at her as Sophie stepped into the cart's path, but she couldn't hear him. Time seemed to slow as Sophie finally looked up too late as the cart careened toward her. Tom reined in his horse and rushed to where Sophie lay in the street. A man was already bent over her limp form, checking the pulse. He grimly shook his head. Tears filled Tom's eyes. The Wildmans had bid him to catch Sophie before she could board the mail coach. He had a letter from the couple inviting her to live with them at Newstead Abbey. The ghost of a young woman wearing an old-fashioned white dress sometimes appears in Newstead's gardens. She's silent and very shy vanishing before one can get too close. Many believe it to be Sophie, roaming her beloved gardens for all eternity. After his death, Colonel Wildman's widow Louisa sold the abbey. The property passed through a few more hands before Sir Julian Kahn, a local philanthropist, purchased it. Sir Khan deeded the estate to the Nottingham Corporation in 1931. Today, Newstead Abbey and over 250 acres of its original parkland is a museum and gardens publicly owned by Nottingham City Council. Newstead Abbey receives visitors from all over the world. Some come for the beautiful antique furniture and Lord Byron memorabilia. Others visit for the lovely gardens. Both staff and visitors tell stories of brushes with the supernatural. The White Lady and the Black Friar still make appearances, but Newstead also seems to have a large number of unknown ghosts. Staff sometimes hear children playing, but when they go into the room, it's empty other times they cannot shake the feeling that they're being watched. Lights inexplicably turn on and off. Hair is touched and certain areas of the house will suddenly smell strongly of a lady's roses or lavender perfume. A grinning cavalier seems to sometimes appear when one looks into an antique floor mirror. Occasionally, visitors on tour will be overcome with feelings of doom or sadness. Some to the point they're sick with emotion and have to abandon the tour. Fog seems to appear and vanish for no reason, even inside the house. In spite of the potential for paranormal mayhem, the historical elegance and beautiful gardens make Newstead Abbey a popular place to wed. Emma stared into the mirror, doing a deep breathing exercise. Needing a moment alone, she had kicked her mom and bridesmaids out of the dressing room. 
Breathe in. Breathe out. Her face was wan, not radiant like a bride's should be. She was lucky. James was tall and clever. A catch. Her parents had sprung for a large, splendid wedding at lovely Newstead Abbey. Out of the corner of her eye, she suddenly glimpsed movement on the bed behind her. Emma whirled around. It lay on her expensive white wedding gown, which was draped across the bed. A large, gooey, shapeless black mass. Two red glowing eyes malevolently glared at her. It couldn't be. Emma was frozen until the gooey black mass started to move. It poured off the bed and began to roll across the floor toward her. She backed toward the door, terrified, but was too late. The goo was already at her toes, washing over the expensive pedicure. Emma hopped and flailed, but couldn't shake the goo off. It was cold, so cold. She tripped and hit the floor. Dazed, she lay shaking as the goo slimed up her pelvis toward her chest. Emma? Her mother impatiently knocked on the door again. Emma was alone, curled up in the fetal position on the floor. No evil black mass, no freezing cold, no anything. Emma sprang to her feet and opened the door. She shoved past her astonished mother and ran down the hall. She couldn't marry James. She simply couldn't. Mother yelled after her, but Emma took the stairs two at a time. In her careless haste, Emma almost hit a shabby hitchhiker as she sped her vehicle out of the car park. Luckily, he dove out of the way at the last second. The further she got from the Abbey, the better Emma felt. She knew there would be hell to pay, especially from her mother, but she didn't care. She glanced in the mirror and the hitchhiker was in her back seat. Panicked, Emma twisted around, letting go of the wheel, veering into oncoming traffic. Just before his ill-fated marriage, Lord Byron claimed to have seen the Goblin Friar, a shapeless black mass with red eyes. Allegedly, the apparition appeared as a warning whenever an unhappy event was about to occur in the Byron family. Some visitors to Newstead claim to have been accosted by a hitchhiker who wanders the long driveway to the Abbey. If you drive past him and look back in your mirror, he'll appear in the back seat of your car. Newstead Abbey, a stunning memorial to the march of time, steeped in the long, complex history of Britain. For over 800 years, people lived, prayed, loved, fought and died at the Abbey. Is it any wonder that the mansion seems to have a palpable, poignant atmosphere? Visit and let your eye delight in the lush in the gardens. Explore the fascinating pastiche of architecture that makes up the mansion. Walk the halls that Byron walked. You may even catch a glimpse of the same spirits that he saw. The ones that keep watch of the Abbey. The ones that loved it so much, they never left. Thanks for listening to Haunted Places. A new episode comes out every Thursday. Listen to all of ParCast's podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, CastBox, TuneIn, or your favorite podcast directory. Many of you ask how to help the show. And if you enjoy Haunted Places, the best way to help is to leave a five-star review wherever you listen. We'll see you next week. 
Haunted Places was created by Max Cutler. It's a production of Cutler Media and is part of the Parcast Network. It's produced by Max and Ron Cutler. Sound design by Ron Shapiro. With production assistance by Joel Stein and Paul Mahler. Additional production assistance by Maggie Admire and Carly Madden. Haunted Places was written by Candace Rogers. I'm Greg Polson. And now, please enjoy this preview of mythology's first episode on the Greek goddess, Athena. It was foolish to challenge the gods. After battling the goddess Athena for three days, Enceladus had all but resigned himself to the fate of so many of his fellow giants. But he'd escaped her for the moment, and perhaps that would become his advantage. Enceladus had barely caught his breath when he heard the horses. He whipped around, worried Athena had tracked him to the Ionian Sea, but it was one of Enceladus' own, another giant. As the giant grew closer, Enceladus realized something was wrong. Instead of legs, Enceladus and his brother giants slithered on two large serpents with snapping maws where the feet should be. But this giant's serpents weren't snapping, and its face sagged. An arrow whizzed past Enceladus' face. This wasn't a giant. It was a god. You foolish, foolish giant. No one rebels against the gods and escapes unscathed. Athena, the goddess of war and wisdom, peeled off the face of a giant she'd flayed alive, revealing her own face dripping with blood. She kept the skin wrapped around her like a cloak. Enceladus's leg serpents snapped and spit at Athena, but their fangs couldn't pierce the hide of his own kind. It was a perfect shield. Athena knocked Enceladus into the Ionian Sea. Then she crouched down and lifted the entire isle of Sycalos. Athena had a divine, godly strength, Plucking an island out of the ocean was as easy for her as it was for a man to pick up his child. Athena straightened up, raising the island above her. She swung it around over Enceladus and slammed the island on his head. Enceladus crumpled under the blow of the island. He sank and then vanished beneath the landmass. His blood and anger rippled outward from the island. The place where Enceladus was defeated became Mount Etna, and the buried giant was reduced to expressing his wrath through eruptions and earthquakes. Yet something wasn't right. As she watched steam build above Mount Etna, Athena knew her heart was missing a piece. She'd used her wisdom and wit to defeat the enemy, embracing her role as a goddess of war, and it felt empty. She was destined for something greater, she was certain. Welcome to Mythology on the Parcast Network. Every Tuesday we present dramatic stories from ancient mythology and explore their origins. I'm your host and narrator, Vanessa Richardson. Today we're focusing on the Greek goddess Athena. She's the goddess of war and military strategy, but also the goddess of wisdom, civilization, and the arts. In her mythology, she's caught between who she is and who she wants to be. New episodes of Mythology release every Tuesday, and you can find us and all of Parcast's podcasts wherever you listen to podcasts. At Parcast, we are grateful for you, our listeners, You allow us to do what we love. Let us know how we're doing. Reach out on Facebook and Instagram at Parcast and Twitter at Parcast Network. And if you enjoy today's episode, the best way to help us is to leave a five-star review wherever you're listening. It really does help us. We also now have merchandise. Head to Parcast.com slash merch for more information. Something to note in these episodes, all Greek myths have many versions and variations. We've selected those we felt are the most dramatic and entertaining, and supplemented them with additional research into Greek traditions. 
Additionally, each Greek myth takes place in a wide expanded universe. While we'll cover some major myths of Athena over the next few episodes, this won't be her only appearance in the podcast. Goddess of the arts and of war, Athena exhibits a dichotomy in Greek culture. She's a woman warrior in a culture where women didn't go to war, and a household goddess who vowed to never be a lover or a mother. Athena is masculine, feminine, and something greater than both. She's a goddess for everyone, and a goddess for no one. Ancient Greek society had clear gender roles, treating women as second-class citizens. But Athena exists outside that construct. She'll skin a giant alive, and then go weave a tapestry. She's as apt to teach men gardening and pottery as she is to help them slay their enemies. Unlike her half-brother and rival, Ares, the war god, Athena approaches war with logic and meditation. At the start of a battle, Ares leaps into action, while Athena waits, plans, then leads men to bloody victory. She values rational thinking over emotion, but is not without rage and bloodlust. Classicist Walter F. Otto characterized Athena as the goddess of nearness because she was always beside the Greek heroes in battle, guiding their spears and swords. She is, like all Greek gods, a killer. However, Athena prefers to change errant humans into other forms, doling out punishments while preserving life. She also transforms herself, taking a male appearance multiple times in the Iliad and the Odyssey. That isn't to say she doesn't embrace a female role, too. In today's myths, the building of the Palladium, the judgment of Paris, and the story of Arachne, Athena strives to be recognized as feminine, and this may be the hardest battle the goddess of war has ever fought. The king of the gods had a headache, and Zeus's son Hephaestus, like many children, was only making it worse. Hephaestus was god of the forge, born with a club foot. To him, a headache was nothing. And then I realized I could put another axe head on my existing axe and kill two men with one blow. Genius, right? Oh, my head is killing me. That's the idea. Both heads could kill. Two heads, one axe. Zeus gestured to his forehead, frustrated. It feels like my skull is expanding and contracting. Maybe I should go... Oh, oh headache. I thought we were still on axe heads. Zeus continued moaning as he dropped to the floor, gripped his head, and rocked back and forth. Hephaestus looked on, torn between sympathy and opportunity. Anything I can do? Maybe take over your duties for a time? Not that a headache could ever take down the great god Zeus. Oh, Hephaestus, will you... Oh. Hephaestus eyed his brand new double-headed axe. Then Zeus doubled over in front of him. The opportunity was ripe. Zeus had overthrown Hephaestus' grandfather. Perhaps patricide ran in the family. Oh, make it stop. End it. I'll cut off my head. Hephaestus hid his grin as he grabbed his double-head axe. After today, the gods of Mount Olympus would bow to Hephaestus. He wound up and aimed straight for Zeus's skull. The axe cleaved Zeus's head in half. As Zeus's eyes spread wide apart, a battle helmet emerged from where his brain should have been. Ah! Hephaestus dropped his axe in shock as a fully armored warrior woman sprang from Zeus's head, shouting a battle cry. All thoughts of ruling Mount Olympus faded in the face of this fearsome, beautiful goddess. Ready for battle, Athena stepped out of her father's head and into the light of Mount Olympus. Athena was born without a mother, the child of Zeus alone. She emerged a rational adult, capable of complex thought, and ready to fight for her life. Yet because the Greek gods are modeled on humans, with human flaws and emotions, 
there is one story of Athena's childhood and a youthful accident that guided the rest of her life. Zeus was accustomed to his children having a mother, so after he fused his head back together, he wasn't sure what to do with Athena. Eventually, the single dad sent his new daughter away to be educated by his nephew, Triton. Triton was a fish-tailed ocean god, so Athena spent much of her time in and around water, and more of her time with Triton's daughter, Pallas. Pallas was a water nymph, a maiden of the ocean, and Athena's only friend. But today, the war goddess and the water nymph raised their swords, squaring off against each other. The pair sparred on the surface of a lake. Pallas floated amid a column of waves, her long hair and shimmering fishtail distracting from her killer aim. Athena defended herself from atop a sleek raft, wearing armor as always. She pushed her sword forward, calling out her moves as she executed them. Striking, stabbing, dodging, ducking, and slicing, lunging. As Pallas lunged, Athena used her shield to knock Pallas over. Rising from the waves, Pallas spit water into Athena's face. Hey! <laughs> Pallas spouted more water, somehow forming it into perfect concentric circles, like aquatic smoke rings. Athena couldn't help but laugh. Pallas, be serious. My father's coming to watch us spar tomorrow. We have to impress him. You have to impress him. If I impress him, you know where I'll end up. And my father won't be happy about that. You're filthy. You've heard the stories, and you have a hundred half-siblings to prove it. Thirty-seven. I have thirty-seven half-siblings. That's an army, warrior goddess. Let's go again. I want to get that spinning parry right. Athena was quite skilled in combat. It helped that she took to it naturally, like palace to water. She'd been ecstatic to hear Triton declare that they were finally good enough to spar in front of Zeus. The proud fathers had invited a crowd of gods, nymphs, and even a few mortals they fancied. Rowing out onto the lake, Athena fiddled with her helmet. She knew her armor made her look ferocious, but she still felt like a child in a woman's body. What if she fell off her raft? What if her mind went blank and she froze? What if her father, the king of the gods, thought she was only average? A terrifying column of water arose from the depths. Inside it, Pallas. She met Athena's eye and flashed a quick smile. Athena relaxed. She wasn't alone. She had Pallas. With her best friend beside her, Athena had nothing to worry about. They began to spar. In the audience, Zeus watched intently. Next to him, his wife Hera, the goddess of marriage, looked around intent in a different way. Aphrodite has such a nice nose, don't you think? Sure. That's it. Slice and dodge. Well done. You've never noticed it? I guess it's fine, if you like noses. It looks quite like Athena's. Don't start on this again. I don't understand why you... She's going to fall in the water. A wave crashed over Athena, soaking her. Athena slipped, but kept her footing on the raft. Come on, Athena. You can do it. Get back up there. Raise that sword. You'll win this yet. They aren't actually fighting. It's a mock spar. At the end of which, my daughter will win. Zeus nervously watched Athena struggle through the next few maneuvers. She's going to fall and embarrass us. Us? She does have a mother. I knew it. I meant Athena and myself. As Zeus worried, Athena relaxed into the rhythm of the spar. She breathed deeply as she pressed her shield against Pallas's sword. Her instincts took over. Suddenly, a new heat rushed through Athena's veins. She'd never felt this warrior power before, but it possessed her. Her feet danced more nimbly. Her sword twisted more sharply. She tasted metal in her mouth. For the first time, she might want to kill. Across the lake, Zeus adjusted his shield. The sun gleamed off of it. 
getting an idea, he tilted his shield, aiming the ray of light at Pallas. In the water, the light caught Pallas's eye. She looked up. Meanwhile, Athena stabbed toward Pallas's heart, a final flourish, the perfectly executed move she was born for. This was her gift, combat. Athena lunged, expecting Pallas to dodge as they had rehearsed. She didn't notice that Pallas's face was tilted up, distracted. Pallas looked toward Zeus as Athena's sword pierced her heart. Instead of blood, water flowed from Pallas's wound. She shrank, dissolving, until all that was left were her eyes, which transformed into two wiggling minnows. Pallas was dead. If you enjoyed listening to this preview of our episode on Athena and want to hear the rest of it, search and subscribe to Mythology wherever you listen to podcasts. New episodes release every Tuesday.